Amen. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to read from the 12th chapter, verses 13 to 34. Listen for the word of the Lord. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grains and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink. And do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Will you please pray with me and for me? Oh God, we come seeking you. Open our hearts and our minds. May we hear from you that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of every heart would be pleasing to you, O oh God, our Savior and our strength. Amen. Well, I stood at the bedside of the wife, mother, grandmother, and now great-grandmother, uh, gathered with many members of her family. Not all of them were there, but many were, and more were on the way, and others would join them within the coming week. We sang a couple of hymns, we prayed a prayer, and I listened to their stories. So many stories of a life well lived, cookies baked, laughter shared, family celebrations of every kind. Several weeks later, a daughter of the woman sat in my office in tears telling a story of a legal dispute over the will, some argument about the division of property, which seemed to her a very trivial matter, but had now been inflated to exaggerated proportions, and it was painting her mother's name and tearing their family apart. Could I pray for them, and what advice? did I have? Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Squabbles over such things can get ugly. 
It wasn't unusual in Jesus' day for a rabbi to be asked to make a ruling of law over some issue that was addressed in the Hebrew scripture. And this kind of thing is definitely uh, has some laws about it in the Old Testament. But you may have noticed as you read uh, through Jesus' life, the stories that uh, are there about him, Jesus doesn't usually enter into such disagreements. More often, he tells a story. And we modern listeners sometimes get into trouble trying to make the story mean more than the story was originally intended to mean. Rather than answer specific questions about the details, Jesus' stories generally are uh, made to get us to see things in a little different way, to uh, knock us slightly off balance and change our perspective, our focus just a little bit. Hey, Jesus seems to say here, there are more important things in life than money. And we might hear the story about the wealthy man and think that he is doing a good job as a shrewd businessman, and we would be right. He obviously has the skill to turn a prophet, which in this case not only understands the many aspects of farming, but also the management of the many people who surely work for him. Farming is hard work under the best circumstances, and a good year deserves a celebration. The problem isn't that the man has done well for himself, is it? The problem is that the man wants to keep all of his earnings, even though it is far more than he will ever need. Grain will rot in his barns while people around him go hungry. Paul Tillich vividly describes this, the attitude of the man as a desire to cram the world into one's own mouth. Uh, doesn't that make you give, it's a good metaphor, isn't it? Cram the world. That's greed right there. That goes, that's gluttony. That's wanting everything. This need to possess everything or as much as we reasonably can collect in a single lifetime. The man has also failed to recognize that he is not the only person involved in his endeavor, hasn't he? Not only does he not give any credit to the other people who are necessarily involved in planting, caring for, and reaping this crop, he has forgotten to give thanks to the very one who sent the rain and the mild weather and the uh, sun to grow the crop. Never mind, you know, the strong body that works hard, the brain that helps direct his decisions, or the breath that fills his lungs. Of course, the man's wealth has left him well prepared for life. If the sum of our life lies in our possessions and what we have gathered and stored up for ourselves. But Jesus suggests that there is a deeper fuller, more meaningful life for us outside of what we own. When we are gone and the dust has settled over our grave, what will be left of us? Jesus challenged us toward investments that are immune to fluctuations in the stock market, that won't wear out over time, and that can't be fought over when we are no longer there to steward them. Being rich is not a crime, but wealth has its limitations. And in God's economy, the kind of wealth that seems to matter has nothing to do with the collection of goods. It has nothing to do with money or possessions. Invest, Jesus says, in kingdom wealth. In God's kingdom, one does not need to worry about storing up goods because God provides all that is necessary for life, food and clothes and shelter. I wonder if the rich man had anxiety about the future like we sometimes do. You know, a fear that God's provision would not actually be enough. And then that was the impetus for his greed, his hoarding abundance instead of sharing out of his good fortune. But lest we focus only on the people who have a lot of wealth here, those of us who are not wealthy can certainly bring our own kind of anxiety about ha not having enough, can't we? Sometimes we feel we must carefully guard what we have so that we do not in the future go without. Jesus is 
talking about us too. What if the story is not actually about how much we have, but about how much we are willing to trust God with what we have? Both those of us who have more than enough and those of us who are just scraping by are called to trust God the same. None of us really know what a day will bring, do we? Whether we will live or die or some tragedy will befall us. What if we didn't worry so much about preserving what we can grasp in this world, trusting God to make provision for what we need in the moment? What if we concentrated on how much God has given us already instead of how far we still have to go? What if we shared as generously as God does? For all of us, rich or poor or somewhere in between, money and thoughts of money can become the thing that runs our lives, can't it? There's been a lot of anxiety about the stock market lately, and I'm included myself in that. But money is not the key to life. Being rich toward God means investing in what is important to God. And Luke Acts makes it pretty clear that being rich toward God means money, specifically, at least some of the time. One third of the parables that Jesus tells involve money or the use of material goods, a full third of the parables. From Jesus' humble birth to his assertion that he was anointed to bring good news to the poor, to uh, his uh, stinging declaration that no one can become his disciple unless we give up all our possessions, Luke makes it clear to us that Jesus' desire for us is to invest ourselves in what cannot be taken away. The problem, the big problem, is that this idea is terribly frightening isn't it? Giving up trust in our material possessions and our money, it's, it's counterintuitive, and it is the opposite of what the world teaches us. Yet time and time again, you, as a body of Christ, have put this promise to the test, and you have watched it come alive. Throughout the history of this church, this congregation has invested in God's kingdom, building and growing to make room for those who came, making place and provision for the needs of a family of God and for the community. And today, we continue to feed the hungry and welcome children, even at times of great sacrifice of our time and money. Just look at what is about to happen in PIP. In spite of resources that can feel scarce, people show up and give of what they have to share God's love with our community. You, many of you, contribute, continue to invest in God's kingdom. Some of us, however, may feel a little reluctant to do that. For various reasons, some of us have decided that the investment is just not worth it. Maybe we have a little bit of anxiety about our future. Maybe we worry that our money will run out before our breath does. Times are uncertain. Maybe we are concerned about the direction of our society. We look around us and we see fewer and fewer people are coming to church um, in, the, in the world at large. Church is just not as important to people as it used to be. Maybe uh, we've noted that since the pandemic happened, even some of the very faithful faces that we were accustomed to seeing aren't here in the sanctuary anymore. Maybe we are worried that we are giving to a hopeless cause. Maybe we don't like the preacher and are holding out for something better. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I've heard it, so I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe we've never given much money to the church because we just don't realize that it's our responsibility to do that. Listening to conversations about the decline of the church and this survey that's coming to you may make us feel even more fearful or reluctant. 
I get it. But I tell you what, I dare you, a double dog dare you, to bring those anxieties to God and see what God has to say about them. God's desire for us is to place our lives in God's hands, to trust God with the outcomes. And God's outcomes are so much bigger than we can even imagine. Our investments in God's kingdom will outlast us, I promise you. Where would we be today if the people who had come before us thought only of what they needed or hoped for only what could happen in their lifetime? Where would we be now as a church? Mm -mm. The investments that we make in God's kingdom trickle out well beyond us beyond our limited scope or vision for the future. God asks us to make the investment and trust God for the rest. It's hard to let go of control, but our confidence in God must be stronger than our fear. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.